Hello, my name is Shu Ritter. The title of my lecture is Passive Seismic Surface Wave Interferometry for Reservoir Scale Imaging. In my presentation, I will talk about the value of ambient seismic recordings for, for reservoir scale imaging. Now, the main thing about my talk is to first of all understand that this talk is about uh, ambient seismic, not controlled source seismic. In controlled source seismic, there's a boat that goes out that sends off shots and we record the, the response of those shots. But in ambient seismic, we simply listen to all the energy that's present in the ambient seismic field. So this is a teaser slide of my entire presentation. On the left, you can see noise recording. This is what you would actually record in geophones when no other seismic energy is present. On the left side, you can see, a, uh, you can see an animation of noise recordings. This is what you would typically record in the absence of any seismic shooting, and you can continuously record this all the time. At the center slide, uh, center piece of the slide, you can see what you can turn that noise into using seismic interferometry. We created virtual seismic sources from ambient seismic noise. And on the right side of the slide, you can see that you can continuously monitor the subsurface and continuously create images of velocities using these virtual seismic sources that were derived from ambient seismic recordings. This is the outline of my lecture. First of all, I'll tell you how we can best characterize this micro seismic noise. Then, I'll show you what cross-correlations of micro look like. Third, I'll show you some applications of surface wave imaging using micro cross-correlations. Then I will finalize with some conclusions. So, these records, they're recorded on the, ocean uh, on the ocean floor. As you can see here, there are several cables lying on the, on the seabed and they can continuously record. Uh, they do this generally when uh, Boats go out and they send off active seismic records, but they can actually record continuously in, uh, in the subsurface. So let me show you where the data comes from. In this case, I'll show you a lot of data that's been recorded at the Valhall field. The Valhall field is equipped with some permanent ocean bottom cables. As you can see on the left, those are the station locations and they're really oriented along cables. So this installation actually has many kilometers of, of seismic cables and each station consists out of four component sensors. Their spacing is about 50 meters in line and 300 meter cross line. They are continuously live. And although the geophones were, uh, had a corner frequency of 15 hertz, they actually recorded very well up to very low frequencies. Now what does the ambient seismic field look like if you would just start animating some time slices? This is a typical ambient seismic recording between 15 and 25 hertz and I just animate some time slices. And as you can see, there's a lot of energy over there at the center of the array. And also every 10 seconds, there's a wave rolling past the entire array. Now what you can see here is a lot of energy that gets that's emitted by the platform in the center. And every 10 seconds, there's actually a, a, there's a seismic wave passing by. The source of the seismic wave was not close by the field, but actually many, many kilometers away. Uh, in this case, as in any other location, just as in the North Sea, and in the Gulf of Mexico, you can actually record seismic shooting basically all the time because at some, some place nearby, there'll be some active shooting going on. Now, if we go to lower frequencies, we can see much stronger platform noise. And we also see some platform noise down in the south. We no longer find any of those uh, waves running by from the seismic shooting from far away, but we really see that it's completely dominated by platform noise. If we go to even lower frequencies, it turns into complete chaos. Now you can no longer see where the wave comes from or where it goes to. These are really chaotic wave fields, but you don't really recognize them as wave fields because they're all aliased. If we go to even lower frequencies, what you can see is that these are not, that these actually form coherent wave fronts. The only thing is that this is a completely chaotic wave field and you can no longer see, you cannot identify one single wave front traveling from one direction to the next. But at the same time, we must recognize that these are waves and they do obey the wave equation. Hence, they're sensitive to subsurface properties. What does the spectrum of the ambient field look like if we would study its spectrum versus time? Here you can see the spectrum of the ambient seismic field as it changes over five days. Now at the higher frequencies, what you can see is shot energy that is um, probably emitted somewhere in the neighborhood of Ecofisk. At the low frequencies, however, you can see a lot of energy there that's very, very strong and it's continuously there. However, it does change over time. We call that energy micro noise. Now what causes this micro noise? Micro noise is excited by ocean swell. As you can see here in this image, two series of ocean swells can be incident on each other. And when they do, they give rise to, to a third um, 
uh, to an excitation at a, at a third frequency. If you follow the black dot here and the red dot, you see that those are the two ocean swells that are propagated in opposite direction. Their superposition causes the blue line. That blue line oscillates at twice the frequency. That's why this energy is sometimes called double frequency microseismic noise. When two swells travel in opposite direction, the pressure of one swell with the other swell, when they uh, superpose, it causes a pressure column that extends till deep down in the sea and pushes on the seabed. This continuous excitation of of the seabed, this continuous pushing on the seabed really starts exciting interface waves that travel along the seabed. Now here I'd like to make a very important distinguishment in my presentation. Namely, I am looking at microseismic energy and not microseismic energy. Microseismic energy is a very common topic of study in seismic studies, but microseismic energy is caused by small little earthquakes. Usually in the case of applied seismic, we call them fracture, uh, fracture energy. But microseism energy is really caused by this ocean swell that pushes on the seafloor. Now, the interface waves they generate along the seabed, they're composed out of two very common surface waves, namely shoulder waves and love waves. Shoulder waves are really Rayleigh waves on the water. And as you may remember, Rayleigh waves or shoulder waves, their, their particle motion is, is in line with the direction of propagation. Therefore, they'll be mostly exciting the vertical components and transverse from component of your Green's functions. While love waves, the particle motion is transverse with the respect to the direction of propagation. So let's look a bit more here at this microseism noise. Is this the same during the whole time of the recording? Does it come from the same places? No, it doesn't at all. In this slide, I show you a beamform experiment where I try to find out where does the energy come from at a given time. And as you can see, Although the energy travels uh, comes from most directions equally strong, there's actually some time periods where it's quite a bit stronger from one side than the other side. However, the fact that it's relatively equally strong and incident from all directions homogeneously does make it quite suitable for seismic interferometry. What do cross correlations of micro seismic noise look like? Seismic interferometry has a long history. It even starts before 1957, but in the earth sciences and for geophysical applications. What we find is that Katie Aki already predicted that you can retrieve the phase velocity, the Rayleigh wave phase velocity, from angular averaging of microseismic correlations. Then John Clairbouch was the first to show that from an outer correlation of a 1D transmission response, you actually retrieve the 1D reflection response. Later he conjectured that if this can be extended to 3D by instead of taking outer correlations, cross correlations. After a series of numerical experiments by Schuster and Rickett, um, it was shown by Lopkes and Weaver using uh, normal modes, by Rolf Schneider using stationary phase analysis, and by Case Wapenaar general, using generalized reciprocity theorems, how this actually extends to 3D and how you can retrieve the full elastodynamic impulse response from coarse correlations of noise. What does seismic interferometry look like as applied on real data? Here on the left, you can see these noise uh, recordings. And here I simply animate a series of time slices. As you can see, it's a purely chaotic wave field. But what would happen if you would take the recording at one station and you would cross-correlate it with the recordings at all the other stations that actually focuses the energy at tau equals zero at that station? And if you then start looking at correlation lags, what you retrieve is virtual seismic sources where the waves propagate at, uh, to all the other receivers in the field with an appropriate time lag corresponding to the period, to the time delay that it takes from that wave to travel from the source to the receiver. So how would this work? There's a quite simple explanation of why seismic interferometry works based on stationary phases. Here these arrows, they represent wave fields traveling in all different directions and they get recorded by the two receiver stations indicated by triangles. Now a cross correlation would actually extract that energy that's coherent between both stations and that corresponds to the energy that travels from one station and then get picked up by the other station. That, that contains the direct wave as shown here but would also contain reflected waves. This effectively turns one of the two stations into a virtual seismic source. But what we find is that the transmitted wave field or the direct waves are by far easiest to retrieve using seismic interferometry. Now here is a, an animation of these virtual seismic sources. And there's another way of looking at these sources. Namely, you could organize them and look at them, uh, these stations as a function of radial offset and just gather all the other stations depending on their radial offset only. Then you get this panel. 
And here you can really see that these virtual seismic sources are dominated by interface waves. They're really dominated by shorter waves between 0.17 to 1.75 Hertz. And as you can see, these waves are very strongly dispersive, which means that one at different frequencies, the wave travels with different velocities. A dispersion image can tell you with which velocity uh, this, uh, these waves travel for a given frequency. And here you can also see how many different wave modes are really present in that gather I just showed you. And in this case, it's mostly composed out of the fundamental wave mode that, that you see indicated there. And much less strongly excited is a first overtone. Now, instead of just cross-correlating vertical components with vertical components, you can actually cross-correlate vertical components with north components and the vertical components with the east component. And as you can see, these waves look much more difficult to interpret. And that is because their polarization now depends on propagation direction. If you just look at their, if you would just look at the wave front for a certain um, time slice here, you can see that the polarity changes as a function of azimuth. So a much more natural coordinate system to look in maybe a cylindrical coordinate system. This coordinate system is the one we record in, with north components, east components, and vertical components. However, after you turn one station into a virtual seismic source, a more natural coordinate system to look at is the cylindrical coordinate system centered at the source, as you can see here, where we define a transverse component, a radial component, and a vertical component. The radial component is directly pointing from one station to the next, while a transverse component is perpendicular to that line. After rotation to a uh, cylindrical coordinate system centered around the source, we can now see that the radial to vertical component cross correlations look much cleaner. And now we see that their, their polarization as a function of angle stays constant. But we also see there's a lot of energy left in the transverse to vertical component. And as you may know, if the Earth would be purely stratified, we actually expect no energy in that component at all. However, the Earth is not perfectly uh, stratified and is also anisotropic. So there's a lot of energy that leaks from one surface wave mode to the next. In fact, we can look at an entire matrix of cross correlations between radial, transverse and vertical components. If we look at these components, the vertical with radial, the radial with radial and the vertical to vertical, they contain shorter waves. They're mostly composed of shorter waves. But if we look at the transverse to transverse component, they're mostly composed of, composed of love waves. This was the dispersion image as derived from the vertical to vertical cross correlations. And it's mostly composed of shorter wave. While this is the image, the dispersion image for transverse to transverse component cross correlations. And they're completely dominated by love waves. And as you can see, the love waves travel faster than the shorter waves. As you can also see, there's maybe a very small first, uh, a very faint first overtone visible even in a transverse to transverse component cross correlations. Now I'd like to make a comparison here between control source seismic and ambient seismic. On the left, you'll see the control source seismic, and on the right, you'll see the ambient seismic. On the left here, we see a gather of controlled source seismic, and on the right, we see a gather for, for virtual source seismic. The biggest difference between two panels is the frequency content. Uh, on the right, I had to apply a high cut filter to select only that energy that would be suitable for passive seismic interferometry. But both recordings here contain surface waves, and that makes them very complementary data. In the next section, I'll present you some applications of surface wave imaging using microseism cross correlations. First of all, I'll show you group velocity images obtained using ambient seismic noise tomography, and I'll compare them to depth slices extracted from an FWI cube. You can do that. Because although these are group velocity images, they are sensitive to different, for different frequencies that will be sensitive to different parts of the Earth. Here you can see surface waves propagating at low frequencies and at high frequencies. And if you look at the particle motion at depth, you see that it is much stronger for low frequencies than it is for high frequencies. Hence, these lower frequencies are much more sensitive to, to regions deeper in the Earth than high frequencies. Here on the left, you see a group velocity image as applicable for, for about one and a half hertz. And that turns out to compare very well with a velocity slice extracted about 80 meters below the seabed. You can see that in the shallow, uh, in the near surface, there's a few paleo channels that cross, that cross the array, both here in the center of the array as in the northern part of the array. And they're quite well imaged using ambient seismic. If we keep going to lower frequencies, we start picking up on features that actually lay deeper in the subsurface. So here I compare, a, about a one hertz image 
to a, to a slice extracted about 125 meters below the seabed. And we start picking up on the corner of a much deeper buried channel. If we go to even lower frequencies, we pick up on the corner of that, that deeper buried channel where it crosses right into the array. And that comparison holds quite well all the way down to about 0.75 Hertz. So what we really find is that using these grief velocity images, uh, using surface waves, we may be sensitive at least up to the top 200 meters of the uh, ocean floor. Now what could you do if you could continuously make these kind of images from ambient seismic noise? Here you can see these images as extracted from 6 hours of noise, or 12 hours of noise, or 24 hours of noise. And although the images obtained from 6 hours of noise are much more variable than those of 24 hours of noise, you can already understand that you can now continuously start forming these images and perhaps start using them for monitoring. These images are created with such high repeatability that if you would compare the images obtained from data recorded in 2010 with images obtained from data recorded in 2004, and you start calculating their difference, you get a time-lapse difference. Now that time-lapse difference corresponds very well with what we know how the velocity has changed over time. So here on the left, you see the result as obtained from ambient seismic, and on the right, you see the result as obtained from controlled sort seismic. And both in the northern and southern part of the array, we see a, a strong increase of velocities. Another data set I've studied is one recorded at ECOFISC, that's a nearby field. ECOFISC also has a permanent ocean bottom cable installed. And at ECOFISC, I created a phase velocity cube um, of these interface waves as they travel. But not only did I look at their isotropic behavior, I also looked at their anisotropic behavior. These little dashes that you can see on the left side of the slide all represent the direction of fast propagation, while perpendicularly the surface waves pro propagate much slower. The length of these dashes indicate the strength of anisotropy, the difference between fast and slow. And as you can see, that forms a large circle kind of centered at the, uh, at the center of the array. And that really is, because what it does is it, it traces the subsidence ball that's caused by production. So now I'd like to finish up with some conclusions. First of all, I've shown you that marine microseism noise provides, uh, proves ideal for seismic interferometry. And that virtual seismic sources that emit very low frequency surface waves can be retrieved using cross collations. Then I hope to have convinced you that these virtual seismic sources are actually of sufficiently high quality that they can be used for time-lapse imaging and anisotropic imaging. And therefore, they provide a wealth of information on the near surface. Because they can be co created continuously from ambient seismic noise, they provide a unique opportunity to monitor the near surface in quasi-real time. I'd like to acknowledge Biondo Biondi and his colleagues at Stanford, and I'd also really like to acknowledge BP Norway and their partners for me to work and show Valhall data. I'd like to acknowledge ConocoPhillips and their partners for permission to show ECOFISC data. Finally, I have a lot of acknowledgements for people that I've worked with at these various companies. With that, I'd like to end with some suggested reading. Aki's paper is really a fundamental contribution here, where he shows that from cross correlations you can actually retrieve information between two stations. Wapenaar, Dragunov and Robertson added a, a very good uh, geophysics reprint series where you can find a lot of the papers that have been published over the years uh, collected together. And Gary Schuster wrote a good book on seismic interferometry. Then there's my thesis and a thesis of a colleague of mine.